and welcome to this, the second panel on the role of educating, education in promoting purposeful business. My name is Colin Mayer. I'm the academic lead of the Future of the Corporation program at the British Academy. The Future of the Corporation final report focuses on the public policies and business practices that are needed to implement purposeful business. But this won't happen without the right business and leadership skills. And we're looking at three aspects of this in the panels on education. We had one this morning, a tremendous first panel on the role of the professions. The second one is on universities. And the third at 11 a.m. UK time tomorrow is on business schools. Business is one of the most important institutions in our lives. It clothes, feeds and houses us and employs our savings. It's the source of economic prosperity and the growth of nations around the world. By emphasizing the role of business in contemporary society, the concept of corporate purpose lends a much greater relevance of business to all aspects of university activities, their teaching and research, than the traditional view of business as being just about making money. It becomes relevant to all the humanities, social, physical, and life sciences. And conversely, all university activities become relevant to the teaching and research of business. We will explore these ideas in this panel. And I'm delighted to introduce the moderator of the panel, Molly Morgan-Jones, who is Director of Policy at the British Academy. Molly will introduce the panel and the panelists. Molly, over to you. Thank you, Colin, uh, for that introduction. And it's wonderful to be here with this group today uh, for this um, second panel discussion on business education. Um, and as Colin has said, this event is part of our events this week following the launch of our final report uh, in the British Academy's Future of the Corporation program um, yesterday. If you didn't have a chance to tune into that launch or the session this morning, I highly recommend it. Yesterday in particular, we had a range of business leaders uh, from Lord Bill Moria to Julia Hogg discussing and finding a remarkable degree of consensus about the agenda before us all. There's a real sense, I think, of excitement about sort of the moment that's in front of us. And I think today's discussion will be really interesting to bring that together with changes that are also happening um, in the higher education sector. Um, so today our core question is, how can universities integrate purposeful business into teaching and the student experience? There are few places and frankly settings in society like a university. And while we may not immediately think of universities as businesses, you know, technically for the most part they're charities, it doesn't mean that the concept of purposeful business doesn't apply. Because what universities have, no matter what size, history, shape, student body or disciplinary focus is a core purpose and function to educate. So one part of the discussion we hope to have today is about whether this educational purpose is their only purpose. What does it mean to educate in the broadest sense? And do we need to think about the wider role that universities have and how this relates to the growing discussion about the value of higher education in society today? And then the other side of it is how universities might interpret the purposeful business agenda themselves. What role can and do universities play in relation to, in relation to their relationships with their students and their development and delivery of curriculum and their research activities um, and so on. So excitingly, we've got a great panel with people from across sectors and across disciplines to do this. Um, and so without further ado, let's get right in. I'll introduce our first speaker, Jonathan Grant, who is the author of a new book, The New Power University, The Social Purpose of Higher Education in the 21st Century, which was published in March earlier this year. Jonathan, given your book has social purpose in its title, the Academy's work is all about embedding purpose within business. You know, what are the similarities between the, your book um, and our report as they both land on this core idea of purpose, but presumably have come at it from, from two different angles? rookie error to begin with. Um, but thank you very much, um, Molly, and thank you very much for um, inviting me to participate in this um, panel. Um, as you said in the introduction, I, I wrote a book um, earlier this year trying to explore the social purpose of higher education. Um, so in reading um, the report around corporate purpose, I have to say I was completely struck about the overlap between those two issues and how 
corporate purpose and social purpose are effectively um, the same thing, or in my interpretation um, of the report. And critically, if we put purpose at the core of the institution, whether that's a company, whether that's a university or another type of institution, we put purpose at the core, then that infects everything else. It infects what you do, your mission. It infects how you do it. Um, and I think part of the unwritten um, and to a degree written message in, in, in the, um, the future of the corporation report and something I bring out much more explicitly um, in the new power university is how we have failed to do that over the last um, 30 years, at least in higher education. Um, you know, a statistic I like to share um, about universities is in the UK, only 38 of roughly 150 universities are credited to pay a living wage. Um, and I just find that a shocking, shocking statistic. I don't think you should legitimately be able to call yourself a university unless you are treating your lowest paid workers with respect and dignity. And I think part of that is because universities have to a degree become um, quite corporatized or instrumentalized in the approach they um, look at their mission. Um, and that relates because they need to think of themselves as a business, but you can do good business um, by treating your staff um, extremely well. The other point I'd just like to draw out um, is that I do also think that universities, um, or at least there's an argument that universities have fundamentally failed in training today's leaders. We are facing this avalanche of different crises um, every day in the newspapers, and the people leading us into these crises um, are graduates of 30 years ago. And they were graduates of a completely exclusive educational system where 20, 30% of individuals are going to university, as opposed to today where we've got 50 and hopefully more um, going forward into the future. And the final point I would like to make in, in a sort of the negative lens before I shift to being tried to be optimistic is that today universities find themselves um, in the middle of this cultural war. Um, and it's a cultural war which um, manifests itself in debates around freedom of speech. And only this week that's been debated um, in Parliament. Um, but it does look at other um, elements around sort of fees for tuition and what have you. And I think the universities are in a very precarious place at the present time um, because um, the social contract between broader society and the university as an institution, um, if not is broken, it's at least eroded. Um, and that's kind of the core argument I set up in the first half of um, the New Power University. And then in the second half, I very much follow um, some of the principles set out in the future of the corporation and try to say, what do we need to do to shift um, that, that dial so universities become that integral part of society. Um, and you know, I don't have time to go into that in too much detail, but fundamentally the issue here is to put purpose at your core. And if you put purpose at your core, that will infect your education and how you educate students. That will infect your research cultures. And critically, that will infect how you operate as a business because it is morally repugnant not to be paying cleaners a living wage. Um, and you know, that for me is, is the, the critical thing. We cannot run a university to support everybody in that community. Um, then we really need to be rethinking what's the purpose of the university. Um, so I think the agenda set out in the future of the corporation report and critically those principles are wholly applicable to universities um, as well as the broader debate around education and research. Um, so I think I've used my five minutes up, Molly, so I'll, I'll stop there and very happy to engage um, in debate with the colleagues on the panel. Great, thank you so much, Jonathan. A range of really thought-provoking um, ideas to, to really get us off to a strong start. Um, I'm sure we'll come back to many of them in, in the panel dis discussion. Um, next, we'll hear from Joe Swinson, who is Director of Partners for a New Economy, a grant-making fund seeking to catalyze transformational change in our economy so that nature and all people can flourish. Uh, previously leader of the Lib Dems, Liberal Democrats, and a member of Parliament for 12 years. Joe also served as business minister, where she secured landmark reforms, including shared parental leave, tougher penalties for flouting minimum wage law, and enhanced corporate transparency on the gender pay gap, 
modern slavery and beneficial ownership. So Joe, we're really looking forward to hearing your thoughts on how universities can change to reflect business and economics of the future, and perhaps picking up on some of the points we've already been touching on. Thank you so much, Molly, and I'm really delighted to uh, join this uh, esteemed panel today for what's going to be a really interesting discussion, I'm sure. Um, I was thinking back to kind of more than 20 years ago when I uh, rocked up about this time of year to London School of Economics to start my management degree, and I'd been inspired to start learning about business and, and study that at university by um, the inspiration that was Anita Roddick. And, you know, as I was growing up and seeing what she had done with the body shop, really, you know, showing a, a way in which business could genuinely be a force for good and not only consumed with the bottom line. And, you know, I kind of met a culture at that university where, you know, so many of my fellow students were just concerned about what well-paid jobs they were going to get in the city when they graduated or as management consultants. And I remember asking in one of the seminars uh, of, of my management class about, you know, corporate social responsibility, as it was described at the time. And, you know, it was, it was kind of like tumbleweed as I asked that question. And then when I graduated and I went to work for uh, a major media company, EMAP, and in the induction, there was a big conference where all the, the new recruits were there and, and one of the head honchos was, was there. So I took the opportunity in a Q&A and I asked him, uh, I said, have you read the book No Logo by Naomi Klein? And, and what do you think it, it means? And he said, well, yes, I have read it, but it doesn't really it doesn't really apply to us because um, that's about sweatshops and, and we're a media company. So, you know, it, it doesn't affect us. And I have to say, I mean, I found these experiences really made me think, although I'd wanted to go into the world of business, how on earth am I going to find a place in business that I'm going to feel happy working in? And, you know, as you know, as you've outlined, I ended up going into politics and, and the last uh, uh, intervening years are, are history. But basically, I think there's a lot of people today who are finding that familiar, you know, conflict almost, you know, and saying, well, do you know what, if, if that's the way business is operating, then maybe business isn't for me. And I think we need to consider the role our universities are playing in that. Now, in my in my new role, uh, we're a grant making organisation and there's some fascinating groups that we are funding that are really trying to change things in universities. So there's the Rethinking Economics group, and this is a student led movement that is fundamentally saying the way we teach economics in university, it's outdated. It is based on you know, treating it as if there's one gospel law rather than it being a social science with different points of view and different ways of looking at it. Um, there is even some, some academics that are taking this seriously. So we fund the core economics curriculum, which has been led by uh, Professor Wendy Carlin from UCL, among others, which is actually, you know, looking at a more modern way of teaching economics. Uh, and, and other groups like the Network for Pluralist Economics and the Oikos International Network that are doing the same for, uh, for business and management studies. But what's really interesting in, in following the work that they do is how much resistance there is within academia to consider new ideas. Um, the way the key journals uh, are really very dogmatic in what they will actually publish and of course how so much of academic credibility is tied up in uh, in publication of, uh, of of articles and also the the citations. So, so I think it's really an area where I would agree with Jonathan. It's it's actually an area of failure amongst a, a sector which is preparing young people for the world. And the key thing, if anything, that universities ought to do is to be teaching people how to question, how to question the world around them. And rather than accept that this is the way our economy has worked until now. And in fact, you know, if you look at history, the way in which business operates that we've been used to it operating has not been how it has always done it. You know, if you look back to uh, the, the history of, uh, of business forms, you know, it hasn't this this kind of, you know, extractivist short term, you know, shareholder primacy model is, is actually relatively recent. So it's, it's not even something which you can say, well, it's always been that way. It hasn't. And we've just learned to accept it and we need to be challenging it and questioning it. And universities of all places ought to be at the forefront of that. If they're not encouraging and equipping young people to, to challenge, then they're not going to be meeting their responsibilities as we approach these interlocking crises that we are facing. And if there's one thing that is going to be 
the constant of the next years ahead, it's going to be about rapid change. It's going to be about non-linear scenarios and, uh, and systemic issues that all affect one another. So we cannot go into it with kind of dogmatic approaches that may or may not have worked in the past, but certainly won't work for the future. So thanks so much. I can already see a couple of different themes emerging. I'm busy scribbling down for our, for our panel discussion about the environment, the wider sort of um, situations, not only graduates will find themselves in, but things we need to do within universities. So, um, but before I uh, diverge too much into that, let's get to our next panelist, who is Tim Chapman. Um, Tim is the Director of Infrastructure Design at ERA. He has been an influential agent for change in setting up new systems to make UK infrastructure systems much lower carbon. Uh, he's also a fellow of our sister national academy the royal academy of engineering um, and it's a real delight to have a, um, a different disciplinary perspective uh, here so tim i know that in your role at arab um, you've been engaged in different master's courses curriculums to reflect the need to embed sustainability more but i'm sure there's much more you'd like to share from your perspective on this topic so over to you um, thanks, Molly. And I must say I was hugely excited when I saw the words purposeful and business because they don't often appear together very often or when they do, the purpose is all about making money. Um, and I think that actually is really depressing. But actually, I think a lot of the other speakers have said so far, it's actually where we all come from, that basically businesses and companies, you expect them to make money, to be totally cynical and to have no higher motive. Um, and in that, you come back to the governance of businesses. And actually, that's also really interesting. And I always advise someone looking to join another firm to understand the governance processes. And by understanding the governance, you then actually understand how the business will behave when push comes to shove. If everything's actually held by a venture capitalist to be one particular set of behavior, um, I'm lucky to work for an organization which is actually very unusual. It's entirely trust owned. So there's no external human ownership whatsoever. Um, it's a 75 year old organization. Um, it's a very successful organization. It is a business. It makes money. We need to keep on making money because any business that stops making money basically fails um, and it fails to do the things it needs to do and it fails to um, pay its people and look after the people it's responsible for. But actually making money doesn't need to be the only thing that it does. Um, and actually to some extent, a certain amount of money is all you need to make and you don't need to be greedy and earn an awful lot more than that. Um, so as a trust owned organization with no external shareholders, um, I think it makes it a lot more of an egalitarian organization. As a reasonably senior director, I hold no shares, no human being, our chief ex global chief that doesn't hold any shares in the business. When we leave, we actually go away with no extra money whatsoever. And I think it's quite an interesting model because it means that actually the interests of the business are disconnected from those of the individuals. And we see I think, very often that the businesses get subverted or destroyed by people actually behaving quite selfishly. Um, so in terms of, sorry, again, when I was read this, I was thinking sort of an MBA or whatever else, um, and thinking about very much of an MBA education I'm going to do tomorrow. Uh, because, but, but actually, that's not the whole thing, because I hugely agree with what Joe was saying. We live at a time of a massive dislocation, probably the biggest dislocation for half a century or longer. We're in the middle of COVID, which is a big dislocation by itself, but we're also facing a series of interrelated crises of climate change, biodiversity, social value. We live in a very divided society where actually all, there's multiple points of failures happening all around us. And therefore, there's a huge amount of opportunity in that as well. And the opportunity isn't just to make money, it's actually to do good. Um, so as an organization, we have last year created um, a new strategy for the, the global organization um, and our purpose we defined in, and that's always interesting again, using the word purpose. So rather than a mission, like most organizations, we've said our purpose, which is a really strong term, is about sustainable development is everything. Um, that's what we do. And actually we're using it now to, 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 to work out which clients we choose to work with, what projects we choose to take on. Um, and that is causing an amount of controversy in an organization that's used to doing things in a particular way. We have clients we, we like, we used to like working with, and we just realize now that what they're doing is not, doesn't fit with our sustainable development is, is everything um, um, strap line, our purpose as an organization. So doing this, and again, as an organization doesn't have to actually pay shareholders, or actually have a whole lot of very short term issues. Um, we're able to invest for the very long term. And again, I think Jonathan's point I agree with hugely because again, as an organization, our biggest stakeholder are our employees, our members, um, and we have to care for people. And again, we're facing into an era um, where people become more valuable. We have a massive shortage of people in the UK. Um, Brexit again is another crisis that's going to actually exacerbate that. So therefore skilled people will be very short in, in supply. 
and how you treat people will is a very short supply. And again, Jonathan's using the example of cleaners, but actually the whole host of people with different skill sets that we need to actually cherish, not just people who actually have been to university with lots of high degrees. We actually cannot function as an organization without everybody who contributes to our end products. So whole life learning is interesting. And again, I totally agree with the point that was made before that sort of in a way, somebody gets a first degree, they might become chartered four years later at a, maybe age 25 and right through to 65, no one actually gives them any extra education whatsoever. There's a little bit of stuff required by the institutions they might be actually a member of, but but I, I totally agree with the point about antiquated skills and they're totally wrong in an area of this great dislocation. So we need to train people for the future. And as Arab, we've set up an organization called the Arab University within us. And I, I must admit here with sort of many academic colleagues, I feel a little bit ashamed about the fact we, I think it's, it's almost comes across as arrogant, but actually it means that we have particular parts of the firm that actually care about foresighting, they care about excellence, and they care about knowledge and information. And what we do in this is critical for our future as a, uh, uh, as, as a learned body trying to make sure we can do good consultancy for clients and help client, our clients to actually succeed in a very different world where an awful lot of the old um, shibboleths and sort of standards have been shifted. And as part of that, we actually sponsor a series of university master's modules uh, with universities all over the world. And our three current ones are with the University of Cambridge shaping a sustainable future because actually we need to help our, our, our leaders not just do an MBA and become slightly better at, um, uh, at strategy or making money, but actually in terms of both ourselves and our clients, making sure that shaping a sustainable future is an interesting challenge. We have resilience of urban systems, because again, we live in an area where an era where resilience of all types, not just resilience against um, climate change, but actually resilience against cybercrime, cybersecurity, and actually societal breakdown are really critical. And the third one, that's one with MIT. And the third one we're doing is with King's College London, which is machine learning and AI. Um, and again, a whole lot of skills that we need to actually stay abreast of the um, changing world and make sure that we are adept at providing best advice and also making sure that we're competent ourselves for the future. A separate part of the organization um, is, is a thing called the um, Ovarb Foundation, which is a trust that we own. We put about half a million pounds a year for no benefit for the, our own organization. It's not a CSR or anything else. It's actually a trust that, that's set up to actually try and further education. And currently we're, further, we're, we're sponsoring a master's program, a, a big master's program for anybody to partake in in Cambridge University called Digital Cities for Change. Again, recognizing the massive dislocation that's taking place. So to some extent, I think my, my main point here are that modern businesses should be engaging with universities in very different ways. As Arab, we can actually engage in a probably more assertive uh, way because we have the ability to spend our own money on doing things that we think are fun and useful and not just sort of in a way in, in, in search of mammon. But actually, I think all businesses that thrive and survive in the 2030s and 2040s need to be looking to the future and doing far more than traditional business success metrics. Thank you. Great, uh, Tim, th thanks so much. And it was great to get both the perspective of how Arab thinks about business, but also then your relationship with universities today. And, and there's a really interesting set of examples and almost case studies that are, that are starting to emerge here. Um, we're gonna move to uh, Bruno Roche. Bruno uh, is the founder and executive director of Economics of Mutuality, a new school of thought and a disruptive model for business performance designed to transform business at the core. Previously, he served as the Chief Economist of Mars um, Incorporated. Bruno, thanks so much for joining us today and really looking forward to getting your thoughts uh, to help kick us off. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Molly, and good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be here. It's good also to be with, uh, with Colin, who, uh, with whom I've been working for the last uh, seven years. And uh, when, when I was asked to, um, uh, by Henry to think about this, 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 the topic, actually, of, uh, of the role of purpose and uh, education, um, I was a bit reflecting on, on essentially uh, a few ideas I'd like to share with you. And as you said, uh, uh, Molly, I'm, I'm coming from, from the corporate world. I've been, I've been working with Mars Incorporated for the last uh, actually 25 years. I've, I've been the chief economist there. And uh, about a year and a half ago, I, I, I quit Mars to set up a foundation which is focusing on, on purposeful business and something which actually started uh, in 2005. And, but I'd like to start with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with a quote of an <clears throat> ancient thinker who said about 3,000 years ago that, <clears throat> sorry, people perish because of lack of knowledge. And knowledge is actually uh, different from uh, ideology. And uh, you, could argue, you could argue actually that the, the place when you, you 
get knowledge is our schools and, and, and university. And most of the time it is true that when it comes to business education, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit sorry because I, I've been educated in a, in, a, in a business school, but when, when I was educated, I, I was actually uh, told that there was only one way of doing business, which essentially is to, uh, to consider the, uh, uh, the remuneration of shareholder and the profit maximization as the sole social uh, purpose of, of any company. And actually, we have to realize that we've been trained, we've been brainwashed over the last uh, 50 years with, with this uh, ideology. And actually, it's in, in my view, it's really an ideology, right? It's similar to Marxism. Uh, it's actually, an, uh, and you know, when, when uh, 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 the difference between ideology and, and knowledge that actually, eventually, ideology is being so challenged that it uh, eventually decays and, and disappears. And I think we, the, the way I usually like to say it here with my friends and, and some of my students is that you know, the Marxism uh, collapsed on, on the Berlin Wall in 1989 and financial capitalism may actually collapse on a different kind of wall, it would be the wall of, of Wall Street. It works fine actually in, a, in the English language is kind of, 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 uh, of what game. So you, you said, uh, you said Joseph, it's all about questioning and uh, and I think one of the critical skills that we will need to learn and relearn and relearn and relearn again is about questioning. Uh, Karl Jesper, the, one of my favorite philosophers in, in Germany, said that truth starts with two people. So it's always starts with, with, with questioning, questioning, questioning. And actually, I think we, it's critically important to, uh, to, uh, to teach our students to question and question again. I mean, even, for, even from, a, from, from a, a religious perspective, I have also a background in theology. And I've been told many years ago by, by a great rabbi, he said, actually, you know, the purpose of religion is really to answer questions, to give answers to your questions, which actually is the, the purpose of religion and ideology. But the real purpose of God is to question your answers. So in a sense, we have to teach our students how to question the answer that we, we, we've been given over the last 50 years. But if you go back to the, the very basics of what, what is economics, you talked about actually reforming the chief economics. Economics is actually, when, when I try to, to, to explain what economics is uh, to, uh, to people who don't know anything about economics, I say, well, it's really simple. Um, economics is about manage, it's management of scarcity. 50 years ago, financial capital was scarce. Today, financial capital is overly abundant. 50 years ago, natural capital, natural resources were overly abundant. Today, they are scarce. So, I mean, 50 years ago, it made sense to invent something called financial capitalism because we needed more capital in the system. Today, it doesn't make any sense to produce more financial capital. We have too much financial capital. I'm calling today from Geneva. And you know, I'm calling from the place where negative interest rates are structured. So it's crazy. And so it, it doesn't make any sense to keep um, a model which is all about addressing the scarcity that no longer exists. So it's not being ideological to say that actually economic will change. I hope it really will change to education, to knowledge, to experience, and not through civil wars, wars or catastrophic events, but it will, it will happen. And in a sense, I'd like to finish my, my, my maybe my, my contribution to this panel by saying that, of course, business education is critically important because it's all about training the next generation of leaders. But also executive education is important. And, and, uh, and with, with Colin, we are engaged in, in training a number of existing and future business leaders. But when you talk about executive education, it, it, re it requires to unlearn a bit. And actually the process of unlearning is more painful than the process of learning. It takes more mental energy to unlearn than to learn something new. But I'd like also to finish that actually it should start even before university, because when, when, when people reach university, it's almost too late. So it really has to start at high school level. And it's one of the purpose we have with the uh, foundation that I'm leading now. But I think we should start with a concrete set of uh, simple steps. Today, uh, the teaching of responsible business, of purposeful business, is still an elective. It's not yet taught at the core. So it's a bit embarrassing because usually you could expect that the academic world should be the, the, leading, uh, the leading organization to, to, to show the way. And, 
And unfortunately, in, in many uh, in many instances, it is lagging behind because the innovation in that space is not coming from the academic world. Unfortunately, I mean, so I think there is really both a duty, but also an opportunity for business education to be totally reformed and in a sense to be turned upside down. We should just put purpose at the center of uh, what is thought at university. And to quote Colin Mayer, he said that, um, and this, that the purpose of business is not to maximize profit. The purpose of business is to develop profitable solutions and scalable solutions to the problems of people on the planet, not profiting from creating problems. And I think if we just take this, this very simple definition, we make it core uh, of, of our business curriculum, we will, actually create, we will actually trigger a system change because any system change starts with education. And it starts with this kind of a understanding that the purpose of business, I mean, stating the purpose of business is about maximizing profit is fundamentally dysfunctional and is even uh, destructive. So I hope actually that through this kind of initiative that we are running with the British Academy, uh, there will be actually a wake up call from uh, business course leaders to, to, uh, to trigger a system change in the way they are teaching business. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Bruno, um, and a lot of um, really uh, stimulating thoughts there, this idea of kind of purpose at the core, as Jonathan said at the beginning, infecting us, but it's coming up in all of our um, sessions here, and also getting the sense of, you know, education outside of just the university, both before and after, as Tim was telling us too, about lifelong learning. So I'm eager, as I'm sure everyone is, to get into our discussion, but before we do, we must hear from our last panelist um, and speaker, Arshia Sahani, an economics undergraduate student at University College London. Arshia has had work experience in strategy consulting and policy research roles and brings her um, incredibly important perspective as a current undergraduate within uh, a university. So Arshia, thanks so much for being here. I'm really looking forward to hearing your firsthand experience with so much of what we've been grappling with. So what have we missed so far in the discussion that we need to be thinking about? First of all, good afternoon and thank you so much for having here. It's such an honor. Um, so when I first heard of the topic for this panel, I thought back to my favorite pastime TV show, Shark Tank. It's an American show. And uh, I think an equivalent in the UK is Dragon's Den from what I've heard. And when I used to watch it, I'd always question, you know, what makes these sharks um, invest thousands of dollars into a company in just a few minutes and you know is it their returns in five to ten years or are there other factors that ensure their success you know in the long term in this constantly changing world and unfortunately I still don't have all the answers and I suspect that's probably because I'm not pursuing a specialist business degree and that's kind of why I'm here today to give my perspective as a student on why it's important to integrate a knowledge and understanding of purposeful business into our university experience. So I'll start by um, talking about how we learn about businesses in the first place. So primarily, obviously, for me, it's through my economics degree. Um, we learn that, OK, a company wants to make money. Um, it will price discriminate amongst its customer groups to maximize its profit. But that's all theoretical. And as Mr. Chapman mentioned, in that university environment, I've rarely ever heard the words purposeful and business together. Um, but what I find lacking is that holistic and more importantly, up to date approach on an understanding of purposeful business. And so then outside university, I've identified two channels personally through which I learn about business and those are active and passive. So actively, I will look for internships and spring weeks. Um, and this has given me a much more realistic view of how businesses operate. And, you know, as you said, how, uh, what, how clients, how businesses choose their clients and projects and what their priorities are. And then passively, I think we all learn as consumers in the economy. So for example, if you're, if you're dealing with um, an unresponsive and unhelpful customer service team, you're gonna question what are the duties of a business towards its clients? Or if you buy from a brand like Patagonia, which emphasizes wear and repair over fast fashion, you're gonna compare it to other brands like Zara or H&M and then appreciate their efforts and their help um, in the climate change agenda. And then of course we have social media um, on every company's Instagram, um, and Facebook and Twitter page, you're going to find their diversity and inclusiveness initiatives. And so through these interactions, and I think as has been reinforced today, skyrocketing profits are not the only thing that matter clearly. And a business that attaches itself with a strong and genuine cause is one that stands out. And I think, you know, what I've realized is that especially true for a younger generation, we automatically prefer to associate ourselves with a company that contributes back to society. 
And this is not just as customers, but also as employees, I feel. We want to be part of an environment or a corporate culture that sees the bigger picture. Um, so this year I've started applying for graduate jobs and um, you know programs. And I found that personally, I'm drawn to companies that invest in new talent and are committed to seeing their younger professionals grow. This can be through allowing days off for volunteering or having mentorship programs for guidance. And for somebody else that might be getting involved with technical innovation or progress by harnessing the power of data or supporting marginalized communities during the COVID-19 pandemic. But the bottom line essentially is that businesses need to help societies face the challenges of the century and profitably solve the problems of people and planet, which is obviously the vision outlined by the future of the corporation program itself. To me, the most convincing argument eventually is that, you know, most of my colleagues, peers, most students graduating from university will either join a business or as, a, as an employee or start or run a business of their own. And so as a pilot, um, writer, engineer, whatever you are, you automatically become part of an ecosystem, whether you pursue a business degree or not at university. And this is something that I think educators need to realize today and then attempt to weave into our student experience at universities. Excellent. What fantastic um, thoughts, both weaving together some of the kind of bigger picture things as well as your own personal um, experience. So we are now going to move into um, the uh, discussion part of this session. Um, and uh, we've got a range of questions that have been coming through um, on the Slido. And I'm, I'm, I'm just struck myself and it's reflected in some of the questions we're seeing. I mean, we've got so many different levels and layers to this um, conversation. So uh, we may skip between them a bit whether you want to use kind of the analogy of concentric circles or sort of the macro and the micro uh, for those who are economists, that probably means a different thing to how I use it. But um, hopefully we'll, we'll have a really interesting thing that comes out. I mean, one of the things that strikes me is we've got this sort of, um, you know, there's both kind of making the case for why purpose is important. There's the examples of good practice. And then there's this wider thing about how do we foster the right environment for universities to embed this. And this links to one of the questions that's come up um, from our audience. Uh, so it's what do you think some of the key indicators of successful university courses should be beyond graduate salaries, which is often what is usually talked about. But if we want to think about, you know, how do we how do we measure and capture different ways of thinking about success of embedding purpose? What might that be and how can we help translate that into an environment that really supports this? Anyone want to take that one on? Jonathan. I'm happy to help you out, Molly. Um, Go for it. I, I would um, reject the question, I'm afraid to say, <laughs> um, and delete the word indicators, um, because I think that's half the problem. I think what we're trying to do is to um, help young people, and not necessarily young people, um, find themselves through a process of education, which is holistic, leads to adaptable um, sets of skills and life skills um, and creates resilience and drives curiosity. Um, and I don't think any of those things are measurable in indicators as articulated here. Um, and, and I often point out when we hear that horrendous word indicator, um, if you're driving down a road and you press the indicator to turn left, that is indicating that you are thinking about turning left, but actually you may turn right or you may go straight on. Um, so um, we do not need to quantify everything. Um, and I think universities need to have the confidence that they don't need to quantify everything um, and focus on, on the values and focus on the purpose, to use the word we're all um, landing on, um, of their educational offering. So I haven't answered the question, but I've reframed it. So. <laughs> Very helpful. Joe. do you want to come in? Um, well, I feel like it's it's been a, a while coming that we should have a, like a little note of disagreement on this panel. So, because uh, I've pretty much agreed with everything that everybody said up until that point. So, I mean, I, I think I think Jonathan's sort of main, uh, you know, principle that the kind of league table effect can be really damaging. That said, uh, I think having some information that's comparable across institutions can be really helpful when people are making decisions and I think you need to have quite a broad set of information because there will be different things that matter to to different people but I mean 
you know, Jonathan made the point earlier about how many universities, you know, pay their cleaners a living wage. I think that'd be a great thing to have as an indicator. What are their, um, uh, what, what is, if it's an endowed university, what, what are their investments doing? What's their investment policy in terms of net zero? Uh, what's their sustainability like in terms of their campus and, uh, and, and the decisions that they're making? And in terms of students, I mean, I think any of these indicators need to have a pretty significant input from students. So, you know, first of all, what are the student views? What, how do the students themselves talk about the university? What do they think it does well? What do they think it should be looking to, to change? And I'd love to see um, student well-being, uh, you know, some, some indicators about that. And I mean, we have, you know, the government collects well-being data, you know, so we've got that information there. Could some of that be collected on uh, on campus? How much uh, the, uh, the kind of mental health support needs are being met? for young people um I, you know i think there's a lot of information that we could be collecting and looking at that is kind of a million miles from this sort of yeah what are starting salaries and as if the only reason to go to university is to increase your future earnings um you know obviously people want to be able to work and do meaningful things and to be able to earn money to to have a good standard of living but but there's so much more um than being able to sum it up in in one number about salary levels Could I hop in and just add Absolutely. a point there? Absolutely, yeah. So I think this talk of indicators is sort of important is because it, you know, gives some sort of accountability to universities towards their students as well. But it reminded me of one of the conversations that I had with my professor. And, you know, she said that when the class of 2008 graduated and they were thrown into this financial crisis, they felt completely unequipped to deal with that situation. And that was sort of a realization to say, you know, we have a problem with this education system. And so that realization and admitting the issue in the system is the first step towards making any change and then, you know, measuring it. So I feel like that might be the base stage to start at. That's a really great point, Arshia, and um, you know, it reminds me, Joe, you talked in your um, opening about sort of the context of rapid change, the nonlinear thinking, you know, a whole range of different challenges we're going to have to face. Uh, it takes us to another um, question uh, that we've had. Um, does this notion of needing to adapt university curricula to be more purposeful necessitate a degree of retraining for those teaching them and, you know, the, the, the lecturers and, and those who are working in universities? Um, and, and, and how, how should we go about doing that? You know, uh, several years ago, I had a, an amazing conversation with, uh, uh, with Joseph Stiglitz, the, uh, the Nobel Prize uh, laureate. And he shared with me like a very simple, very simple concept. He said, business is about people and data. And eventually the, the bulk of the education is on the data side. And we tend to forget the, uh, the people side. But eventually, that's why we need more sociologists, psychologists, anthropologists to actually understand the, uh, the people dimension. And you know, there is, a, there is this famous quote that Colin often uses. He said that that's actually the word uh, company comes from a Latin uh, word, uh, which is companis, which literally means the breaking of the bread. And the breaking of the bread has a, has, has a profound connotation. It's about actually fellowship. It's about actually building trust relationship. It's about actually being together and, uh, and healing relationship within the community. So we should never forget actually that, yeah, I mean, the, when we do company, when we make company, it's not about producing data or making profits. It comes, but actually the, the primary purpose of a company is to, uh, yeah, is to nurture fellowship. That's actually why we do company. And that's why in a sense, uh, uh, company and entrepreneurship existed way before capitalism. I could exist actually, and will probably exist after capitalism. Uh, if capitalism is not in service of company, it will actually disappear. But essentially uh, one way actually of moving from the current uh, set of uh, teaching is actually to bring the more people side into the teaching of, uh, of business. Sorry. Thank you, Bruno. And of course, at the British Academy, we love uh, being reminded of the importance of, of the full range of disciplines. Uh, and you've also nicely brought in linguistics and languages in dissecting company there for us. Uh, Jonathan, you wanted to come in as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think to the question about whether we need to train academics differently. Um, actually, the, the, the question there is the incentive system for academics. Um, and that's what we need to change. Because currently, for you to progress as an academic, 
um, you have to be as reductionist as you can make it out. You have to identify the most obscure topic that you can investigate, whether that's in the biomedical sciences or in the humanities, and become the world expert on that and publish your findings in obscure papers and journals that nobody else can read um, because you created your own jargon and you have to pay to read them. Um, and what we're saying here is actually from an educational point of view, rather than a research point of view, we would like to be um, educating and graduating more holistic individuals who have a broader spectrum, um, which they can then take in the workplace. Um, that, that, th those two things are at tension with each other. Um, so actually we need to be respecting, if you like, monodisciplinary expertise, but adding into the university mix recognition for people who are able and willing to work horizontally um, in a multidisciplinary way, bringing disciplines together. And that is really hard in the current academic incentive system in the West. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. And, and part of that, you know, a broader um, kind of environment within which universities um, are uh, possibly constrained from thinking about this. Tim, did you want to come in? Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of really inspired in a way by the, 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 the different points of view on this. And just going back to metrics, I was just reflecting that um, I'm probably old enough to remember the Bristol Babies case where um, um, in the UK, um, a particular lot of hospitals had a very, very, very high death rate of babies who were being operated on. And they're trying to actually understand what the culture was and everything else that led to this. As an engineer, um, I like counting things. I like things that you can measure. I like metrics. But actually, um, one of the reactions to this was to actually measure the death rate of every service in the UK and quite a lot of hospitals actually publish that information online which is actually quite scary um, especially if you know people who are going in to be operated on by a particular surgeon but they also found the very perverse um, thing that came out of it was that the better surgeons often had worse death rates uh, because the better surgeons did the more difficult cases um, and therefore they were penalized by actually what they were being measured and it comes back down to probably actually talking about a lot of the purposes of things that we're trying to do here again as a designer of big infrastructure um, uh, we often, we're beginning to think much more about the outcomes of what we're doing rather than actually just, let's just build a new whiz bang fast railway line between London and Birmingham or something like that but it's actually about the societal outcomes that we create by doing this um, and I think we're doing that much more now but very often I'm I, when I'm talking about big infrastructure, the, the overall outcomes we're seeking are basically about society. It's about a happier, healthier, satisfied society. Um, and then you bring in things like education, other things like that. But it's actually not necessarily money because we all know money doesn't buy happiness. A certain amount of money buys happiness. But I'm, I'm quite intrigued by, by the metrics which are talking about here in terms of salaries um, and actually the way organizations which don't pay their salary, their, 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 their key staff fairly. I mean, in the middle of COVID, who is more important to you than your cleaners to make sure that you don't actually have a major outbreak and to not pay your key staff uh, properly sounds really odd but actually I think in a way the outcomes are probably best described in words rather than numbers and I probably I'll be shot down by many of my engineering colleagues on that but actually I think once you a lot of these things when you bring them to numbers you very often get very perverse and per, per, perverse answers yeah, it, um, uh, I, I think that's a really um, great set of um, thoughts and sets us up well for, for the next kind of uh, related set of questions, thinking about outcomes. And, and, and one is, you know, that there are a lot of um, sort of priorities, I think, if we start to take that to the next level of, of what we should think about with teaching our students. So climate change, biodiversity, health, inequalities, uh, you know, there's a whole range of those kinds of societal outcomes. So how do we make sure that they're not competing with each other, you know, they're all about different kinds of purpose. Uh, um, and, 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 and how can, you know, purposeful, you know, the ideas around purpose and purposeful business really help uh, bring that uh, together. And I suspect maybe there's something there, Tim, Bruno, about businesses working closely with universities or some of what those inputs are to help us get to outputs, because they shouldn't all compete with each other. We should be able to, you know, uh, integrate them in some way. But um, yeah, any, any thoughts on, on how we sort of start to reconcile some of those competing broad Broader societal outcomes we're looking at. Tim. If I maybe, if I go first, I mean, I, I think basically Britain is a knowledge economy. Um, we need to actually find what Britain's place is in the world, um, and it stopped being making things quite a long time ago. But therefore, it's actually selling knowledge to people, and therefore, what we do with knowledge workers is absolutely critical. And universities are the places which should be training people the most. And I think actually, in a way, um, th there is sort of the degree factory aspect of how we give qualify people at the initial stages. But uh, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have done a masters in my life. Um, I learned a huge amount from it going. 
uh, and actually could do into something in more detail. And I think there should be an awful lot more about lifelong learning and universities don't do that. I, think I was very interested in Jonathan's point about actually in a way what the system is about writing papers in obscure places and according to how many brownie points you get is how well you do, not actually how well you inspire your class. I know some very, very inspirational university lecturers who remain lecturers despite being absolutely brilliant, hugely concerned with their teaching, um, but teaching is not rewarded. And I think we probably need to change that fairly fundamentally in the reward system where teaching is valued because actually passing on knowledge is the whole function of a university as far as I'm concerned as a member of society, as a member of business. And if universities forget that, it's, it's, it's not good. Research is absolutely vital. Remaining ahead of other people in terms of proper useful knowledge is really important. And again, British Academy does a huge amount to stimulate those kind of things in, in programmes like this even. But I, I think fundamentally we need to make sure that universities go into lifelong learning properly. Thanks. I'll bring Joe in if that's okay, Bruno, and then come to you. Um, and then Ashley, if you'd like to come in on this as well. So I just wanted to, to share a concept that I recently came across, which uh, I thought was brilliant, and it's called multi-solving by uh, Beth Sorwin in, uh, in, in the States, and she's been uh, running a kind of uh, amazing data program that helps climate mapping for, for many years. But this concept of multi-solving is basically about trying to find solutions to, to multiple problems at once. I mean, it seems to make a lot of sense, a very efficient way to do things, but so much of our systems are aligned to kind of optimizing for one variable. So if it's in business, it's the bottom line. And if you're a country, actually, if you look after the GDP figure, somehow everything else will look after itself, which of course is absolute nonsense. And so even within um, governments or businesses, you have departments, you have uh, particular teams looking at climate or a separate one will be looking at, you know, diversity and making sure that uh, race and gender discrimination are, are being um, kind of resolved. Uh, and, and in fact, these you know, these crises that we're facing, you know, the, the sixth mass extinction, the biodiversity loss, the breaking of all these planetary boundaries, the careering into catastrophic climate change, the massive inequality uh, between the, the wealthy and the, the poor in society, which has, of course, been a, a gap that has grown significantly um, in terms of recent years. You just need to look at what happened in the pandemic where you know the stock market and investments have gone up while you know two million people have died around the world and you know the economic hit to to the poorest has been huge um you know a while you know you know race and uh, and gender violence you know the the horrific you know um you know murder just this week just you know sabrina nessa it just is sort of constant and all these crises are interlinked so we have to start finding the solutions and actually they're not against each other because it turns out that if you look after indigenous people's land rights that's actually much better for biodiversity and protecting the environment if you try to invest in a major retrofitting program of modernizing housing you can actually help to deal with fuel poverty for some of the most uh, vulnerable people in our society while also providing lots of jobs and employment and indeed also cutting climate emissions and carbon emissions. So finding these multiple solutions I just think has to be the way we look at things and it does mean that business, government, universities need to be looking at a much broader set of disciplines um, to, to pick up on the point that I think um, Jonathan was making about this kind of narrow specialisation rather than being able to take a broad approach. Thanks, Joe. Bruno. Well, you see, when we, are, when we are dealing with kind of issues, we are dealing with systemic changes. And of course, uh, uh, systemic change can, can only be achieved if you have a, a coordinated set of, of actions ac across different parts of, of the system. And education plays, in my view, a critical role, uh, but, but, but also uh, the research. So, for instance, I mean, I, I, just to give you a, a, a personal experience, I uh, we started this journey on what we call the economics of majority in 2006. And at that time, the chairman of the board of Mars came to its management and I was part of the discussion and he asked one simple question. He said, what should be the right level of profit for a company like Mars? And nobody could answer this question. And actually the question wasn't asked in the context of do should be more profit or less profit, but it was more like, is there a kind of profit that would maximize the performance of the business, right? That was the, uh, and you know, when we did our research, nobody had written something on this topic in economics or management science. You find, we had to go through a, 
in, in anthropology, sociology, history, but not in economics. So we have, there is a blind spot. Okay, so I think it's not only about education, but they're also producing knowledge. And I'd like also to build on, on what you just said. We are at a very important, well, a very interesting point in time. You see, we are, we are moving into what you call team, the knowledge economy. So we are transitioning from a service economy, which is financial capital intensive, to a knowledge economy, which is human and social capital intensive. So the underlying uh, assets that we will need to prosper is fundamentally different. And yet the way we are, uh, we are researching, we are teaching, we are educating, is still stuck on the old model. So I think there is, a, there is a, a, I mean, a, to some extent, again, it's what I said earlier on, uh, the market actually is, uh, is, is already integrating this. So we have many companies today who does not, that does not even make a penny of profits. Right, but still have a huge market capitalization. Why? It's because uh, uh, even imperfectly, the market actually internalizes the positive value creation that uh, the, the, the the knowledge economy is creating, and the uh, and the knowledge economy again is is social and capital intensive. Therefore, understanding how to measure, manage, nurture social and capital is a critical skills and discipline that need to be part of a business education, but it's not there yet. Right, and Ashia, do you want to come in? And then I have one final yes, no question for the whole panel. Definitely, so I think um, as a student, what I love about economics is that it's a subject which you know exposes you to a variety of perspectives on the same issue. So you know, when you look at a problem, you're always gonna think, how does it affect the different stakeholders involved? So it's the government, the consumers, the producers, whatever it is. And, you know, so when you look at a business strategy or a policies that you're thinking of implementing, you have to see, okay, how does it affect wages and living standards? Or, you know, what's the carbon footprint of this particular step that I'm going to take? And integrating that into the way that you teach your class, you know, business or economics or whatever subject it is, is extremely important. And I think I agree with so when, you know, when she said that a diversity of subjects and fields that you learn will help you sort of broaden your perspective. And I think I have evidence of that personally as well, because I took a class in psychology last year alongside my economics modules. And that was so, so helpful in seeing, okay, you know, how is this decision made and what goes into that um, procedure? So yeah, I think, I think, yeah, I agree with that for sure. Great, thank you. Okay, one last question, I'll go down the list. Um, should senior managers of universities be held legally responsible and accountable for embedding and implementing purpose in their business models? And this links to one of the recommendations in our report about um, how we achieve accountability for purpose. So, uh, Jonathan, I'll start with you. Uh, yes or no? Uh, yes. Maybe a caveat that we can come back to in the next session. <laughs> Tim, sorry, you're still on mute, Tim. I think it was bound to. Um, uh, yes, but actually I'm accountable more than responsible because accountable means more, I think. Very good. Joe. Yes, and it's probably not sufficient. Lots of other stuff needed too. Very good. Bruno. Uh, yes, and actually not only a yes, in, in design, in, in being purposeful in, in words, but also in action. So in a sense, there should be alignment between uh, the educational practice and the purpose. Thank you, and Arshia, last word. Yes, too, and I hope it's enough of an incentive to make the changes required. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, as ever, I wish we could go on for probably um, several more hours. Uh, I'd love to get back in the room with all of you and many of our audience out there. But for now, thank you all very much. And Colin, we'll turn back to you for uh, a few final closing words. Thank you, Molly. Um, and I should begin by thanking the uh, panel for having given a 100% vote of confidence in what we're putting forward uh, in the uh, uh, final report of the program. Um, we heard this morning how we need purposeful professions to promote purposeful businesses and hold them up to account for doing it. Uh, we heard this afternoon about the importance of, uh, of purpose in education. We need to have purposeful... Sorry, I've got a machine that's going on. We need to have purposeful universities that have a clear idea of their role in society. They should be focused on people, on promoting their knowledge, capabilities and capacity and their role in society. That makes all the humanities 
and social sciences, and also multidisciplinarity important. Likewise, we need to align business education with educating people about purposeful businesses. The nature of business has changed and education has not moved sufficiently with it. Those I think are really powerful messages about putting purpose at the heart of universities, about having the notion of that purpose, about being focused on its role in society and on people and on promoting their knowledge, capabilities and capacity. And uh, I'd like very much to thank all of the panel, Shear, Bruno, Joe, Jonathan, Tim, uh, and our moderator, Molly, for having given us such a stimulating uh, overview of the issue and such a, uh, an interesting discussion. Thank you very much indeed to all of you. And we'll end now with a short film that records how a segment of the British public and some experts view the topics that the Future of the Corporation programme is addressing. Thank you very much. provide stability to the employees that they've got. Something continually rolling to help within the community as well. Incorporate other brands that are, you know, are also doing the same sort of thing. Mental health care. We are willing to act charitably in our minds, but not really putting our words into action sometimes. I think it's really important for businesses to be transparent and that it's constantly, you know, rated. Corporations put their purpose at the heart of everything that they do. It will make them think very differently about their social and environmental impacts. So I think there's lots that we do in terms of the way in which we operate, from our carbon footprinting, we get that independently verified, and 100% of our profits are given to all trade. I suppose the key thing about being purpose-driven, it gives you that framework for the right sorts of decisions in order for you to fulfil that purpose. The challenge we have at the moment is that we need to rewrite the rules so that all businesses are behaving responsibly. We can't deliver on our purpose of providing sustainable long-term returns for our clients if we invest in companies who are seeking short-term profits and creating problems for society. If we want to build forward together, we have to have a sense of urgency across board. And we need to pivot very quickly to a model of capitalism that is regenerative and restorative. And we need new, bold, fresh ideas to frame how we build that new economy. And the future of the corporation is, is providing that insight and that intelligence.